Hello, everybody. I'm Mark Coleman, um, and we are here with another episode of Talking Tax on Think Tech Kauai. Thank you very much for being with us. I'm the co-host, uh, along with Tom Yamachika, who is president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii and a prolific writer of columns that you can see in, on his website, the Tax Foundation of Hawaii website, and in newspapers around the state. Uh, I'm with the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Uh, today, we're going to talk about um, a, a recent article of his, his latest article, which was called Owning in a Burn Zone. And he was talking about the uh, the predicament that private property owners in Lahaina find themselves after the whole town burned down in early August uh, with all the plans to rebuild it. Um, there's a lot of questions about how the town is going to be rebuilt. And he brought up some, Tom brought up some really interesting points, um, primarily suggesting that we have to remember that there are private property owners in Lahaina whose uh, rights as property owners need to be, be uh, respected. Uh, but yet, of course, there's also government uh, concerns and the community at large that has to be considered. So uh, in addition, we have uh, Jonathan Helton with us today. He's a policy researcher at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii, which is where I work also. And uh, Jonathan has been doing a lot of research recently into the Lahaina situation, Maui's stoning codes in particular, which will play a factor in the rebuilding of Lahaina. So Tom, how about first we 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 get you to explain a little bit more about the what prompted you to write this article? Um, I noticed that you did cite a really good article by John Hill in Civil Beat, which which inter, which comprised uh, consisted of some interviews with private property owners in Lahaina, uh, how some of them feel like um, their rights are being ignored. A lot of people want to come in and master plan top down sort of, and and yet there are people there who you know they have. They have their homes burned down and, and they have a big say in how it should turn out. So could you like summarize that for us and what your th views are on that? Uh, sure. <laughs> These days, there's a lot of talk in the news and elsewhere about rebuilding the burn zone that was once Lahaina. You know, it was the former capital of the Kingdom of Hawaii. And the question is, you know, can or should it be restored to its former 1800s glory? Should it be keeping a character as a picturesque but sleepy little fishing town? Uh, or should it be something else? Uh, obviously, government will have, you know, some role to play in the rebuilding. Um, and there have been community meetings that have uh, kind of attempted to address what the rebuilt line is going to look like. But there are, you know, folks who kind of came away from that meeting going, wait a minute. Um, listening to these people talk about all their plans for the property, but it's not their property. <laughs> all the rules they wanted, uh, it's absurd. Right. The socialist mentality, they think they own the land. That's a, a direct quote from, uh, from, from John Hill's uh, piece. Right, uh, right. He quoted uh, some developer in Maui as saying that. Yes, right. So, so let's kind of explore, you know, what uh, is going on in Maui, uh, what private property rights are, uh, what what the government's role is, because you know, I mean, a, as a tax program, we look at the government's role a lot, and uh, you know, let's let's talk a little bit about where where the lines are. Yeah, I like it in Tom in John's article, and actually, you 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 pretty much said very much the same thing. It, in, what is, does it mean to own land in the U.S.? In large part, it means that you get to choose what you do with it, uh, but there are limits, master plans, zoning, building codes, et cetera. In theory, these are a larger, these are a reflection of larger societal values. But what I liked uh, in your article was how you pointed out that um, although there's some master planning and zoning will probably survive scrutiny, officials should not be going hog wild with restrictions on new development or risk claims that private property has been taken. Um, we talked about that a little bit, uh, you and I offline um, yesterday. Well, could you explore that concept a little bit? Yeah, when I talk about property being taken, um, I'm talking about, uh, you know, the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution says that private property uh, shall not be taken except for a public purpose. And if, and if that happens, uh, 
there needs to be compensation paid for it. Uh, you know, the government can't just take your property for no reason. So, for example, and I'll bring I'll bring Jonathan in on this at this point. Um, there have been a lot of proposals about exactly how should they be allowed to rebuild. Um, I know the Grassroot Institute, Jonathan's work, we've proposed that people whose homes burned down, well, like you pointed out in your article, it, it was kind of, there was a lot of construction in Lahaina that didn't meet code, modern code. And, um, and, and so one proposal was to let people be exempt from modern building codes they were they were operating under exemptions from you know they were grandfathered in so to speak as the codes were developed um, and now when they rebuild do they have to meet modern code or can they can they build like what they used to build Jonathan what, what what's 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 your take on all of that if a if a property was completely destroyed it's probably going to have to rebuild under modern building code um, so there's a question of how does the county um, offset some of those burdens because the building code today is stricter than it would have been 50, 60, 70 years ago when a lot of these houses were put up. So there's a discussion of what code requirements should be imposed on some of these houses. And there's, and so maybe if all of, if the modern building code is what these houses are going to have to be rebuilt under, there might be room for the county to, um, almost compensate the owners for those stricter requirements and say, maybe we would give you some, some zoning density that you would be allowed to either use on your land or to sell to someone else, kind of as, as a compensation for the fact that you're gonna have to rebuild with all of these um, stricter standards in place. Well, let's, let's kind of start off with, with uh, uh, the zoning laws. Now, when we're talking about zoning laws, the general rule is you, uh, you you build to the zoning codes that were in effect at the time you build, and if the zoning laws change, which they do over time, uh, then you're usually allowed to keep what you got. But if you make some kind of substantial alteration uh, to your property, then you got to comply with the current codes. But uh, a number of the structures that uh, were there in Lahaina when uh, you know when it burned down were, of course, 70, 80 years old. And uh, if they hadn't done any substantial structural renovations, uh, they were uh, under 70 or 80 year old rules. Right. So, no, so number one is um, there's a realization at least uh, some of the rights uh, or, or the uh, the rights that you had as a grandfather in under the old rules uh, don't exist anymore because like everybody's got to substantially rebuild. So the the justification for keeping under the old old rules has kind of gone away and, and therefore everybody's looking at you know some different uh, some different set of you know rules that are on the table uh, when the rebuilding happens and, and I guess the first question is, is, is that a taking? Uh, and is that something that's been within your research, Jonathan? I haven't looked into the Fifth Amendment implications of, um, of, of rebuilding in a burn zone yet, although I, I, I'm going to go do that right after we get off this call for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, there's, there's a, a whole uh, body of law uh, regarding... Uh, what they call inverse condemnation, oh, yeah. which basically says that if you substantially change um, the use that property is going to be put while somebody's on it, uh, then you know at some point you cross the line and you got to compensate people because there's a taking under the Fifth Amendment, and uh, and 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 these issues came up like for example when Hawaii Kai was being built. Because there was a lot of zoning changes uh, when the Hawaii Kai development was going up, and a lot of litigation happened back then. Well, you know, one problem with the Lahaina thing is that people are homeless, and this has to be this can't take forever um, to to find new homes for people. 
Um, a Gary Gary Kubota, uh, former Star Bulletin Star Advertiser writer, he wrote a really great column uh, on Tuesday in the Star Advertiser, an opinion column, and um, he was the title was "Rebuild the Heine Town Soundly and as Quickly as Possible." Um, I, I loved what he was saying. He says, "Let's not get caught up in the global warming discussions and pushing back the locations of homes and businesses from the shoreline in Lahaina, where it was a fire." That destroyed the town, not the ocean. Taking away the use of the harbor front property would be government overreach. And then he says, if Amsterdam and Venice can find solutions to keep existing businesses in or near uh, structurally in near areas in structurally sound buildings, so can Lahaina. Um, so again, I'm, I'm wondering how much leeway the uh, county is is going to be willing to give local homeowners and businesses to rebuild their homes quickly, which would require, I think, um, some exemptions from the, from the zoning codes, uh, waivers of fees that, will, that cost money um, and, and other things that kind of get in the way of, of doing things quickly around here. Jonathan, what do you know about how the, um, the governor's emergency proclamation applied, his housing proclamation, versus what's going on at the county level from Mayor uh, Richard Bisson. Yeah, I want to get into that, but real quick, just by way of comparison. So the 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 Paradise Fire in California in 2018, that happened in November of 2018, and the first certificate of occupancy um, was issued in July of 2019. So it was less than a year after that fire that people were able to start rebuilding to some extent. Now I need to look further into whether or not. Um, the state of California or the local government provided any sort of um, waiver or incentive for quick rebuilding, but obviously it's possible. Um, but but to comment on the emergency proclamation, so the second emergency proclamation that Governor Green um, issued in October, he did specifically exempt Lahaina. And uh, on the other hand, um, Mayor Bisson's emergency proclamations, he's issued several of them, and they're not they're not just specific to housing. They cover a lot of different things. Um, but right now, those emergency proclamations at the county level are not going to uh, have much of an effect on rebuilding because I mean, no one's allowed to rebuild anything right now. As far as I know, um, EPA, Army Corps of Engineers, the county, they haven't even cleaned up the entire burn zone. So those emergency proclamations are not would not really have a real effect until the cleanup is um, is finished. Yeah, so, nobody's issued any building permits at the moment, right? Yeah. Uh, Tom, what, what, I, what I read in the paper just the other day was thousands of Maui property owners, primarily in Lahaina, haven't yet given government, haven't yet been given government permission to clear their debris. Uh, altogether, 350, 3,500 homes were lost in line in upcountry Maui, and only about 900 people have uh, been able to get government permission to remove debris. I mean, this whole thing is like a, uh, being run by, it's a snail fest, practically. I don't even know that, I remember one of the early complaints was that uh, uh, the insurance adjusters weren't allowed to even go in there and, and, and assess what's, what's happening. I don't know where that stands now, but... Um, so the the and and one of the rules that Mayor Bisson talked, where the county council approved a debris removal bill in mid October, just about a month ago, um, and and I th and part of that was uh, that uh, had to do with um, under the bill, homeowners could opt for a government program of removal administered by the F Federal Emergency uh, Management Agency, and then there was another one. Uh, an alternative of which they hadn't really explained yet. But according to one article I read, uh, it, it costs thousands, tens of thousands of dollars to get this stuff removed. And and uh, so I, I don't know, it's a really complicated situation. Um, what do you think about that, Tom? Um, well, you got to start somewhere. <clears throat> uh, you, if you have like toxic substances on, the, on, on, on your property, you got to get rid of them first. Is there, is there is there well i'm just wondering if there's a quicker way to do things um it does seem terribly complicated 
and and there are safety considerations. Um, Jonathan, what's your take on that? I think the county is currently looking at a place they can put a landfill in order to um, put some of this toxic debris. Because again, this goes back to the building code discussion. You had a lot of materials that were used in houses, you know, built 60, 70 years ago, I think asbestos, that are not allowed today because they're, you know, they can be hazardous. And so all of that's burned. And you you don't want that getting into the ocean or the drinking water. And so even trying to figure out a place to move these debris too does take um, consideration. You can't put this in a normal landfill. Uh, you, obviously, you wouldn't want any of that sapping into the drinking water. So it is complicated, and I don't have a clear answer for exactly how you run a cleanup of a burn zone. And um, I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm focusing my research on what happens what once people are allowed to rebuild. How do we make that as streamlined as possible so people don't have to move to the mainland or another island. Yeah, Tom, you were talking about that in your article about how, um, you know, once, let's just say the debris did get all removed and people were allowed to proceed, we would have the issue of zoning, you know, maybe possible waivers of zoning codes so people could rebuild similar to what they used to have. Um, but also, you, you were suggesting that there's the issue of infrastructure, uh, the roads, you know, and the, the water lines and the electrical power. Um, you yeah, know, the problem is that, um, you know, cities don't exist by themselves and they don't exist in a vacuum. Like, unlike uh, maybe rural properties, you need to have some form of, uh, you know, sewer. You have to have some like water lines. You should have electric uh you know, for for the more enlightened, enlightened, you'd, you'd need like uh, cable TV or you know other kinds of you know communications infrastructure, uh, and and that's that's something that government has to do. Well, it, those the, it, the uh, in the I mean, Lahaina probably grew organically. You know, it was not a master planned community like they're trying like they've been trying to do with Kaka'ako, for example, on Oahu. They didn't go in and kick out everybody and and then start laying in the sewers and you know with the with the long range futuristic vision of a of a new community. That sounds like one of the options that a lot of the of the visionaries for Lahaina want to do. You know, they the town they didn't eminent domain people, the town burned down. So it's a similar situation. It's a clear it's a clear piece of property now. Except that there are individual property owners there, so that that's the quandary, isn't it? You can't just yeah. go. Well, you just can't walk in and start planning a way to your heart's content to meet whatever uh, goal vision you might have about restoring. Uh, yeah, I mean, when when you uh, plan a planned unit development like Mililani. Um, you basically have the developer own all of the land first, and then they can, you know, they can make all the decisions at that point. You right. know, that's fine. They can, uh, uh, they they can create rules on, you know, what kind of houses you can have, what kind of houses you can't have, uh, what kind of setbacks uh, you you can have, how, uh, what what your floor area is, what your ratio is, um. And all of that they can put into a, a document called um, CCNRs, uh, with, uh, Covenants, Conditions, and Restrictions, uh, which new buyers in the property either sign up for, uh, or they don't get they, they don't get in. But at least there's at that point there's an element of choice as to whether you're going to uh, accept those uh, restrictions or not. Right, kind of and, like private zoning in a way. Yeah. It, the, but the big difference is that for for the the folks in Lahaina, they own the property already. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it didn't have those restrictions before. Uh, people are proposing restrictions now, and um, uh, I mean, is that really fair to them? Yeah, I, I, I'm Jonathan. What would you suggest 
should be, you know, what would you recommend for the the future of Lahaina? Some of the in terms of zoning waivers or 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 changes or whatever. So to begin with, you have to if the county has plans for the houses that were burned down, they know what the density was, they know what the setbacks were, they know the floor area ratio, they know all of that. So what the county could do is if they don't want everyone in Lahaina to rebuild exactly with the same density that it had, you know, because of the because zoning codes have been updated, they could allow people to sell that additional density somewhere else or add it to their home in a different manner. Um, alternatively, they could simply allow people to rebuild to the previous density level they had. A, you know, a lot of the um, businesses and shops on Front Street probably were not built with modern zoning code. They didn't have setbacks or parking requirements that you would have to have now. And it, the county could waive that if it has the building plans. Obviously, if it doesn't, that's another issue. But in addition to zoning, um, you also have to th think about special area management permits, and you have to deal with those. And because so much of Lina was near the ocean, that may factor into the situation. I don't know what the answer is there. Well, certainly um, uh, one possibility is uh, for Lahaina to be designated some kind of special district like Waikiki is now. And um, I, I don't know whether that's helpful or hurtful, but uh, it certainly makes the, the rules different and uniform within, you know, within, within the uh, community, but maybe non-uniform everywhere else. Yes, that could help. Well, um, you, you, yeah, there's there's so many competing visions for the place. I, it reminds me of the of the of the of the protests uh, that were trying to keep tourists out, and a lot of those people weren't even from Lahaina. You know, they weren't even from West Maui. We have all kinds of visions to like preserve the waterfront and you know setbacks, kind of what Gary Kubota was talking about, what you were talking about. But ultimately, um, <clears throat> I. Th I think it's going to be up to the property owners and, and, and working closely with the county. Uh, is your sense, Jonathan, that the county is is open to um, waivers and, and uh, working along the lines you suggested? I think the county is going to be open to some changes. Just yesterday, the council was having a meeting about um, trying to make it easier for prefabricated homes to be assembled. There was a company there presenting, um, trying to asked the county about emergency shelter um, on county-owned land. And, and that all of that would be built with a, with prefabricated homes. So they uh, panelized homes, they'd come in and they'd be able to put them up in days. And so maybe, you know, whether or not that materializes, that's a different question, but it does indicate that um, there are conversations going on about um, some more innovative ways to address at least the temporary um, housing needs. Yeah, and, and when the economists uh, weighed in on this, um, they kind of raised another issue in that uh, they thought that, you know, if the same density levels were maintained, uh, the property values would escalate well, well beyond uh, what, you know, the, the workforce needed in the city could afford. Mm -hmm. So so uh, I think it was uh, Carl Bottom who suggested that, density level should be allowed to rise, that, that we should have, you know, some high rises, maybe, you know, uh, off, off the, uh, uh, you know, back, you know, back toward the hills. Maybe a low rise apartments, right? Uh, perhaps. Lower, lower high. Yeah. <laughs> Multi-story buildings. Uh, yes. yeah, yeah, you pointed that out. And I think uh, that's a, that's an excellent idea, frankly. Um, if if property owners are, I mean, they're in a real bind. A lot of them might sell, are probably going to sell. They 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 can't afford to stay here in Hawaii, you know. So, uh, or in Lahaina, anyway. Maybe they'll have to and move in with family elsewhere throughout the state. To just so they have those funds now. Uh, there's a government proposed fund set up. Uh, Tom, you heard about that, where they want to maybe offer a certain amount to victims that apply. And, but, yeah, that's 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 our next article. Yeah, you wrote about that already. You 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 suggested that idea, and then boom, uh, 
that came out from the governor's office a, l- a little bit, you know, uh, more nuanced. Well, well they, they said they were thinking about it for three months prior to that. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, <laughs> is that they would be exonerating? They would be letting go of of any future claims, you know, in terms of lawsuits and whatever. Um, does that? Uh, uh, how about that as an idea uh, to help out the people in the in the short run? Does that make sense? Um, we. Uh, we think it's a great idea, but it, it deserves a lot more discussion than we're able to give it today. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just worried that the, the folks there are going to be living in hotel rooms or shelters on the beach or whatever for a lot longer than it, than should be because of all of the concerns, uh, all of the restrictions on home building in this state. Um, Jonathan, have you got any last thoughts about what could be happening over there? Yes, I would like to give kind of a PSA. Later today, the Maui County Council, um, or I guess later on Wednesday or Thursday, whichever day this is, I guess I'm lost. But the point is, Maui County Council is considering a bill related to property tax relief. And that that factors into this as well, because um, individuals who are who might be looking at a high property tax bill otherwise, you know, could consider selling because their home's not there anymore. Their property taxes go up. They don't have an income. They don't have a home. So I'm glad that the council is looking at the question of how do we provide relief to people so they're not forced to sell or the county even comes in and foreclosure, forecloses on the property because they couldn't pay the property taxes. Absolutely. So I'm glad that conversation is happening. Yeah, me too. Um, and and Tom, you, you, I wish we had talked a little bit more about property tax relief. They have been doing a good job, I think, trying to address that issue, even at their own expense, or at least in terms of the county coffers. But, you know, Tom, you closed your article. We definitely need a careful, well-thought-out community design that older and newer property owners and renters can choose to participate in. That, that's about the, the way, that's about it, right? Well, yeah, that's that's the best of all possible outcomes. I don't know if that's, it's going to happen, but but that's what we need. Well, Let's hope it does uh, for the sake of Lahaina and Hawaii in general. It's a real sad situation and we need to see the best of it come out. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jonathan, for being here. Thank you, Tom. Good to see you again. And we'll see you all again in about two weeks, I hope, here on Taxing, Talking Tax on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha.